Thank you, and thanks to everybody. Thanks to Helen and PSR for sponsoring this, and thanks to everybody for taking time today and hopefully tomorrow on this important topic. As is not a surprise, today is the second anniversary of the disaster at Fukushima. An earthquake and the tsunami it fostered caused three reactor core meltdowns and forced tens of thousands of people to leave their homes. Next slide, please. Was it shock and awe, a tragic surprise that could not possibly have been foreseen and avoided? No. Was it shock and awe? No, it was all shucks. It was a series of foreseeable hazards that just weren't dealt with responsibly that triggered the accident. The disaster began with an earthquake measuring 9.0 on the Richter scale. Not a surprising challenge. The Fukushima plant had been designed for severe accidents, and all available evidence suggests that all safety systems survived the shaking and were cooling the reactor core as intended. But the earthquake extensively damaged the electric power grid to which the plant was connected. When the plant was running, it's supplying electricity to the grid. When the reactors were shut down, it needs electricity from the grid to power the pumps, the motors, the dampers, the lights, and everything else that needs to cool the reactor cores. It had long been known that the grid was not protected against earthquakes even smaller than 9.0 and could fail. Forecasting that the grid might be lost, workers had installed more than a dozen diesel generators at Fukushima. One diesel generator per reactor was all you needed to cool the safety systems to prevent reactor core damage. The rest provided backup safety. When the earthquake took away the normal power supply, these emergency diesel generators automatically started and were providing power to the equipment needed to cool the reactor cores. In addition to taking away the normal power supplies, the earthquake also generated a tsunami that arrived about 45 minutes later. Forecasting that someday a the ocean side plant might experience tsunamis, workers had installed a seawall, protective seawall around the plant that was nearly 15 feet tall. Unfortunately, the tsunami that day was nearly 45 feet tall. Years earlier, researchers in Japan had forecast that the site might receive a, an earth, a tsunami wave close to 46 feet tall. But the plant's owner and the regulator dismissed this foreseen hazard on the grounds that it was overly speculative and not substantiated. It's now been substantiated. No changes were made to the Fukushima seawall. The diesel generators for the three reactors operating at the time of the quake were located in the basements of the turbine buildings, the buildings closest to the waterfront. Tsunami waters scarcely impeded by the short seawall inundated the site and flowed into the turbine buildings through open doorways and ventilation system louvers. The diesel generators stopped running as the water submerged them. All of the diesel generators had been placed in the basements of these buildings. This placement afforded the greatest protection against earthquake motion, but the least protection against flooding. Consistency is an overrated quantity. Inconsistency improves the chances that you're right some of the time, even if you don't know when that is. Put another way, diversity is your ally. If you, if you mix up how you do things, chances are you're going to get some of it right, again, even if you don't know when that is. But the company put all of its eggs into one soggy basket. Forecasting that the electric grid might be lost and that the diesel generators might someday fail, workers had installed banks of batteries with sufficient capacity to power one safety system for up to eight hours. But some of the backup to the backup power supplies were also disabled by the floodwaters, and the surviving battery banks were only capable of providing power for eight hours. The plant was without power for nine days. Eight hours is much less than nine days. Forecasting that multiple safety systems might occur someday, workers had developed procedures for using backups to the backups and using diesel-powered pumps on fire trucks and barges to provide makeup cooling water to the reactor cores. But the pressure inside the reactor vessel or the pumps produced enough pressure only against one quarter of the pressure inside the reactor vessels. In other words, you needed to reduce the pressure in the reactor vessels for these pumps 
to be able to send water in. Forecasting that it might become necessary someday to lower the pressure inside the reactor vessel, workers had installed valves that could vent the reactor vessel and into the containment building and vent the containment building to the atmosphere. But these valves needed electrical power to work. Anytime you use a backup clock in the control room to tell you what time it is, you're in trouble. <laughs> in cruel irony, three reactor cores at Fukushima faced the threat of overheating due to ocean waters that flooded and disabled the backup power supplies and equipment they, they powered. The power loss also prevented workers from using the backup to the backup systems, sitting literally a stone's throw away from the Pacific Ocean, a fairly large body of water. Three reactor cores faced meltdown due to lack of water. Forecasting that reactor cores might someday overheat and melt down, producing large amount of hydrogen as the fuel melted down, workers had installed systems to purge the air inside containment and get rid of the hydrogen. Even before the plant started up, systems were installed to replace the containment air with nitrogen. So that as the hydrogen was released from a damaged core, it would mix with nitrogen. No oxygen was present, and it could not explode. But the accident caused the pressure inside the containment building to go very high and force that hydrogen into the surrounding reactor building, which does not have nitrogen in it, except for the nitrogen that came from containment. So the same thing that caused the containment to fail caused hydrogen to get into places it was not supposed to be. There were instruments provided inside containment that allowed workers to monitor the amount of hydrogen, the amount of oxygen inside the containment, and to vent the containment when it became necessary. There were no instrumentation at all inside the reactor building to monitor the hydrogen or the oxygen concentrations. That was the first clue workers had that hydrogen was in places it shouldn't be. It's a little bit late when that's your clue that things are going awry. Hydrogen gas escaped from the containments into the surrounding reactor buildings. And the result was three reactor buildings uh, al fresco. No roof, no walls. Took a while to do that too. It didn't happen all the time. With all these forecasts of hazards that were identified, the only surprising thing about Fukushima is that no steps were taken to manage the hazards. The warning signs were all there for many, many years prior to that disaster. One only needed to heed rather than ignore the warning signs. The three reactor meltdowns forced tens of thousands of people to evacuate their homes, and they're not going back anytime soon. The Japan Center for Economic Research recently estimated that the cost of Fukushima was somewhere between $71 billion and $250 billion in U.S. money, or U.S. dollars. It's not going to be our money. This includes $54 billion to buy the contaminated land of people who had to leave their homes within 20 kilometers, and $8 billion in order to compensate the residents. Even if the actual price tag ends up being at the low end of this $71 to $250 billion range, that cost far exceeds what would have been a prudent safety investment years ago. Had the electrical grid been fortified to withstand an earthquake, the continued availability of electric power would have prevented this disaster. They would have had electrical supplies for the workers to use any number of equipment that was already there. Had the seawall been raised so that the height was taller than the tsunami wave, the combined availability, the normal power supply and the backup power supply and the backup to the backup power supplies would have prevented this disaster from occurring. Had the diesel generators and associated electrical buses been located at some at high elevations, some at lower elevations, the likely availability of some of this equipment would have prevented the disaster that occurred. Had the battery banks been installed such that some of them would have survived the tsunami wave and the rest of them 
would have lasted more than eight hours, an artificially short period of time, the disaster would have been averted. Had workers been given a viable plan, if all three of those things failed, the disaster would, been, would have been averted. The cost of all of these measures, had they been taken, would likely have exceeded $71 billion. The costless item on that list, hardening the electric grid itself, itself likely would have cost more than $71 billion. But it would not have been necessary to pay for all of the upgrades, or even the most expensive of those upgrades. All they would have had to do was pay for one of those upgrades, even the cheapest one, and we wouldn't be here today. Symposiums are not held to talk about disasters that have been avoided. If a taller seawall had been erected around the site, none of the other safety measures upgrades would have been needed. The taller seawall would have kept the tsunami in the Pacific Ocean instead of on the Fukushima plant, and the safety equipment would not have been flooded and taken off the table. Unless you'd have built the seawall with gold, it's hard to imagine that the taller seawall would have cost more than $71 billion. If each Fukushima reactor had been constructed with one diesel generator low and one diesel generator high and provided air-cooled diesel generators so you didn't need the cooling water for the diesel, likely one of the diesels, at least one of the diesel per reactors, would have survived even the shorter seawall and prevented the disaster from occurring. I worked at a plant here in the United States that added an additional meat diesel generator. It was $100 million, considerably less than $71 billion. If each Fukushima reactor had been equipped with the means to reduce the pressure inside the reactor vessel and containment so that the diesel-driven fire pumps that were sitting there could have actually worked, the disaster would have been averted. Independent battery packs and compressed air cylinders is all they would have needed to get those valves to work. That's ultimately what they used because they went out to the parking lot and took batteries out of cars and went to a contractor shop to get compressed air cylinders, but they got them too late, not in time to prevent disaster, in times to mitigate it. So all the hazards that factored into Fukushima's tragedy had been foreseen for many years and had fixes readily sitting on the shelf waiting to be installed. Severe accidents like the one at Fukushima keep occurring because nuclear plant owners and their owners keep pretending they cannot happen. Pretending is to protection like guessing is to knowledge. We have the capability to protect against these hazards. Nuclear power plants can be built and operated successfully against known hazards. We struggle against unknown hazards, but we have no excuse for operating plants vulnerable to known hazards. We only need to match our capability to handle these known hazards with the will to do so. When researchers concluded that Fukushima might experience a tsunami taller than its seawall, that should have led the nuclear plant owner and the regulator to evaluate whether we need to build a taller seawall or take other steps, like relocating emergency diesel generators or providing a reliable backup, so that something survives the tsunami threat that you know you're vulnerable to. It's okay to pick the cheapest from amongst those options unless the cheapest is to do nothing against a known hazard. That's irresponsible. People should go to nuclear jail when they make those decisions. And you could have followed that process for every, any one of these hazards. Anytime you, the battery power was only designed to last for eight hours, somebody should have answered the question, what happens at the ninth hour? If the answer to that question is we hope for a miracle and we distribute rabbit's foots, go back to the drawing board, come up with a different solution. That's the wrong answer to that question. The, the reason they didn't get a wrong answer to that question is they never asked it. The easiest way to duck a question is not to ask it. I had a department head in college who said it doesn't matter to have all the right answers until you've asked all the right questions. They didn't ask all the right questions and they're paying a high price. 
So plant owners and the regulators can consider setting a protective standard less than a known hazard as long as there's an evaluation shows that there's something other than luck and miracles that will step in to save the day. While this works in practice, consider for a moment if the disaster at Fukushima had been caused by an asteroid impact. It's unlikely that asteroid shields would now be being built around plants in Japan or elsewhere. The answer to that one what if question involves little changes at plant sites and likely involves more changes in our ability to detect incoming asteroids. How has Fukushima affected nuclear safety here in the United States? Some claim it cannot happen here. If the it they're referring to means the status quo that allows the Nuclear Regulatory Commission to pretend these things cannot happen, they are right. It cannot happen here. We're not ending that status quo, apparently. If the it refers to severe accidents, they are dead wrong. Prior to Fukushima, the NRC learned about a plant in South Carolina that could be flooded to a depth of 13 feet, a foot higher than Fukushima. The NRC's own risk analysis calculated there was a 100% chance that all three reactors at that site would melt down if that occurred. Very little has been done other than hide the documentation about this threat. A hallmark of nuclear safety is defense in depth, a normal and a backup system, a backup to the backup, to make sure that you have core cooling even if a single failure occurs. But when that single failure is underestimating the likelihood of severe accidents such that you take no measures to protect against them, you're setting yourself up for Fukushima. We've done this again and again over decades. There are no su nuclear surprises. The only thing surprising is why we continue to do that. One of the definitions of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, hoping for a different outcome. It doesn't work. The technology is too unforgiving. So had Fukushima aimed higher on just one of the barriers I went through, just one, not all of them, just one, we wouldn't be here today. But more importantly, tens of thousands of innocent people would be enjoy back in their homes with their belongings, enjoying undisrupted lives. That's not the case. For them and for millions of potentially innocent victims tomorrow, we must do a better job protecting against known hazards. Thank you.